There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Anybody else like that song? Worship this morning, worship this morning was incredible, incredible. Shout out to my wife who was leading. I'm going to talk to her a little more later. It's amazing. She leads sometimes. She's better than me. It just is what it is, guys. It's amazing. Well, good morning and welcome to Heritage. Listen, we're in week four of our sermon series called Rooted, and we've talked about the soul, and we've talked about getting into the word. We've talked about spending time with God, and today we're going to talk about worship, which is fitting. I'm the worship pastor here, all right? So if you don't know me, my name's Drew. I'm the worship pastor, okay? And today we're going to talk about worship. We're going to change some perspectives, some hearts, and some minds in the next like 40 minutes. Does that sound good to you guys? Awesome. Let's pray before we get started. Lord Jesus, I pray this morning uh, for courage to speak the words that you intend, and I pray for your guidance through this message. I pray that we get a new grasp on what worship is meant to be in our lives, and most importantly, help us take action with what we learned this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So a lot of people have their ideas about what worship is, right? A lot of people think that it might be a song or singing like we just did, but uh, worship is not a song. That's more of just an expression of worship. And so today we're going to talk about what worship is. The truth is, is that no matter what, no matter if you believe in God or not, we were all created to worship. And we all worship something. Our worship is aimed at something. Now, this doesn't make you evil or a bad person, okay? It's just, it is what it is. Everyone has an outlet, and it's not that God doesn't want you to have an outlet. It's just that he wants to know he is first. He wants to make sure he is first. He is the highest thing, the first thing you worship, because actually we were created to worship him. And there are different kinds of worshipers out there. Um, And before we dive into that, I'm going to give you an example of all these different kinds of worshipers. Before we do that, I feel like we should define this word so that we're all kind of on the same page. So this would be a great opportunity for you to grab your pen, paper, the program. It's got notes, okay? Uh, I read this statistic. I don't know if you guys listen to podcasts, but I listen to about 11 a week. It's a lot of podcasts, okay? But I read this statistic lately. And it's talking about if you listen to an hour's worth of information, uh, you can retain 30% of that information. And you can put into action about 10% of that information. Ah, but if you're distracted, like me, and driving most of the time you're listening, you can only retain about 10% of that hour talk and put into action about 3%. But if you take notes, if you're locked in and you take notes in an hour speech, you can retain up to 60% of what is said and put into action nearly 30%. So if you're not taking notes, at least pretend to so that I feel better, okay? Here we go. Let's define this word. Worship is to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, and devotion. We'll say it again. Worship is to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, and devotion. Now, this doesn't mean for God necessarily. Like any of you ever been a sports worshiper? We're called fans. Some of you are probably thinking of me, all right? Like I'm a huge West Virginia fan, huge. And we're all devoted to a team, fans. We're devoted to a team. Think about what we do when going to a game. Think about what we put into it. We honor their tradition. We tailgate. We make an entire day out of it. And no matter how bad our season is, this year will be the year that West Virginia wins the Big 12 and beats Oklahoma. Sorry, got off on a tangent there. So, fans, sports worshipers, right? Some people work, uh, worship possessions, Okay, like cars. Like, have you, ever, have you ever been in that dude's car that's just like immaculate all the time? All right, and like you can't eat in that car, like no eating in that car. And it always looks great. And when we go to the grocery store or when we go to eat somewhere, like we're gonna park as far away as we can because heaven forbid it gets a door ding or a scratch. All right, and they probably named it like Jessica or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like those guys, like we worship possessions. Some parents worship their kids. All right, so we're not even going to dive into like the moms that share clothes. We're not even going to go into that. But like you might buy a $300 baseball bat for little Johnny who can't hit a fastball. 
You see what I'm saying? Or here's another example. Like, if you grew up just not playing soccer, hating soccer, never want to be a part of soccer, but now your kid plays soccer, so you're an assistant coach to the travel team, and you're yelling from the sidelines, and you're ready to go because you think there's a small chance he might go pro. But you forgot they got your DNA, mom and dad. They got your DNA. They're not going pro. All right? These are all forms of extravagant devotion. When I met my wife and we were dating, and I hope she would say even to this day, that I was, am extravagantly devoted. Our connection pushes me outside of what I would normally do. And that's what worship does. It takes you out of your comfort zone. It pushes you into something that you wouldn't normally do. You know, normally I don't high five and, and hug strangers. Like that would be a little weird if you showed up this morning, you don't know me, and I just was out in the parking lot giving out hugs, right? But when West Virginia scores a touchdown, everybody gets a hug. Everybody gets a high five. Like we are pumped, right? Another definition of worship is this, to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. Now we don't, we don't like that word. I said the S word. Submission, we don't like that because that's when you got to tap out, right? Like some of y'all watch UFC or maybe you played that game Uncle or you were like me and you just had an older brother that just beat you up all the time, right? That's when you got to tap out. That's when you, you don't want to do something, but you do it. You leave what comes natural and you step into something that doesn't feel natural. Like when I come to work here during the week, I don't like paint my face blue and gold and wear West Virginia stuff. That would be a little weird, right? But uh, in 2011, when LSU played West Virginia in Morgantown and LSU was like a top three team in the country and we were decent, all right? Like it was near October, it was uh, near Halloween and me and my brother and some friends, we went to this like party city, got a bunch of Halloween masks, spray painted them blue and gold and wore masks to the game, all right? Pray for me, I know, I, I know. It's not, it's not normal, I know, it's not normal. It's not something I would normally do. And you probably don't shout for your kids all the time, but something takes over you when they're out on a field and you start yelling, you start passionately talking to the umpire or official. Something makes you scream when a goal is scored. Something makes you even proud when it doesn't go their way and they strike out. You go to extreme levels of praise because of your investment. So let me put this in the simplest form I can, and, and I'll just say this. If, you, if you're planning the next like 40 minutes to just tune me out, okay, if you can just get this next sentence, if you're just, if, if you're just like, here, man, I had to come here. They told me I needed to be here, man, so I'm here. If you can just get this next sentence, if you can grasp what I'm about to say, understand that every moment of every day for the rest of your life could be changed. It could be different. Worship when it comes to God, is yes. Worship, when it comes to God, is yes. Worship is yes. It's saying yes. It's a yes. Every time we say yes to God, it's worship. We can worship God through a song, not because we're singing, but because our stance and our posture is a yes to God. You know, we can sing songs and it's karaoke, but we put a yes, God, on the end. You have been so, so good to me. Yes, God. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, God. Then it becomes worship. Every time we give financially, it's an act of worship. And that's a lot of times while we'll uh, play music, while we're doing the offering, because it's a moment where you could have spent money on yourself, but you chose submission. And we don't give out of obligation, but because we say yes to what God has called us and the church to be. We say, yes, God, we worship you, and so we give to you cheerfully. And you can worship God through your life, how you live, what you say, what you don't say, what you participate in, young people, what you don't participate in. If what you do or don't do is a yes to God, then it's an act of worship. Yes is an act of worship. 
And obedience is an act of worship. Now, I'm not just talking about the Ten Commandments, right? I'm talking about when God moves you to, like, pay for somebody's gas or groceries. I'm talking about when God moves you to talk to your neighbor about your church. I'm talking about when God moves you to speak life into the world instead of hate. I'm talking about when God calls you to stop complaining and just be part of the solution. I'm talking about when God says, stop listening to the world that tells you lies and step into your calling. Worship is yes. And it's amazing when you say yes to God, what God will start to use around you as your mission field. My wife and I live pretty close to a dollar store, and that's kind of like our go-to. Like if I'm just picking up a 12-pack of Coke Zero, or I'm going out to get like some Sour Patch, okay, I'm very healthy. Um, if, <laughs> if I'm going to do, like that's a quick run, like hey babe, I'm just going to run out to the dollar store, and I'll be right back. And then... My wife started noticing that there's like a, a receipt for $30, there's a receipt for $50, there's a receipt for $60, and I'm like, oh yeah, about that, listen. So there was this lady in front of me in line, there was this guy in front of me in line, and it seems like lately, every time I go to the dollar store, there is somebody in front of me having a horrible, horrible day, and they just look worn, and God's just nudging me like, hey man, pay for that. But here's what I've noticed in all of those opportunities. When God asks us to do something that we wouldn't normally do, we immediately question if it's God. We immediately question it. Like, man, is that, well, I don't know, I don't know if that's you. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just get my stuff. I'm going to go home. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. And then maybe you could give me a sign, like maybe a hawk shows up on my car, and I'll be like, that's the Lord, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is what we do, though. This is what we do. God says, pay for that person. We're like, is that even you, God? Man, I hadn't talked to you in a while. Like, I don't even know if that's you. But it's amazing how God calls so many of us to go on vacation. <laughs> it's amazing when we look at our calendar and we say, well, look how that opened up. Yes, Lord, let's go to the beach. Like, we get so excited when it's what we want. But man, when it's not something we normally do and it would be outside of what we normally do and God, man, that might start a weird conversation and man, look, man, I'm buying a 12-pack of Coke Zero. I'm not about to spend $60. But then you find out that the person in front of you has been moving her daughter to college all day. And that's why she looks so worn because she's just been crying. And you find out she's at the dollar store buying moving materials. And she just had a hard day, man. So what's $40? What's $50? What's $60? When you can bless another person. What I've learned in my very short time is that you have three voices in your head. Some of you got more. Y'all a little crazy. All right. But you got, <laughs> you got three voices in your head. You got you. You got the devil. You got the Holy Spirit. So there's a really good chance that if you have something in you, something stirring in you that says, pay for that, and you don't want to do it, but you know it would end well, now you found out which one's the Holy Spirit. And the sooner you start listening to that voice, the better you're going to understand the love God has for you. Every time you obey God, it's an act of worship. We had a Global Leadership Summit meeting here a few months ago, and, and a couple days after it, I got a phone call from a gentleman in our congregation, and he calls me. He's like, hey, man, I just, listen, I just wanted to talk. I don't do his voice well, so I, I know he's here today. But he's like, hey, man, listen, I just wanted to take a second. Um, the other day when we were in the meeting, I said something. I probably shouldn't have even said it, man, but I, I just want to let you know, I meant nothing by it, man. Like, I think you're great. I might be embellishing here, but taking some liberties. I think you're amazing. You're a wonderful dude. But, but he wanted, and, and I'm sitting there like, uh, dude, like, you don't have to call me and apologize. Like, I know you. Like, you're my boy. Like, don't even worry about it. It's nothing. Mm. But, it, but it was something. Because, see, something was stirring in him that said, you know what, you really need to call him. And that might be an awkward conversation. That might be a weird conversation. He might be even, like, taken back and be like, actually, that did offend me. And, and now you've got to have a whole other conversation. But he obeyed. 
And what he didn't know is that opened up a door for him that he didn't even know was there. And it opened up a door for you months later to hear that as an example in a sermon that he didn't know I was writing. Every time you obey God, it's an act of worship and we all do worship. And here's what I know. God isn't mad at you for cheering for your football team. And he's definitely not mad at you for having outlets in your life as long as they are not destructive. Please hear me, please hear me. Do not misquote me. God is fine with you having outlets in your life as long as they are not destructive. God isn't trying to keep you from loving or supporting your team or your kid. God just doesn't want misplaced worship because when your worship is out of place, your life is out of order. Anytime you put worship in the wrong place, it's gonna get real dysfunctional. And that's why God says he wants our worship first. He wants to be the first priority. When you worship God first, you'll become a better parent. When you worship God first, you'll become more appreciative of what God has provided you with. You can be a fan. When you worship God first, you'll appreciate things, but they won't have you because God has you. So he just wants to make sure he is first. If your worship is out of place, then your life is out of order. Okay, you didn't think I was just gonna talk to you the whole time with no scripture, right? So go ahead and get out your Bibles. If you brought your Bibles or if you're using the YouVersion app, happy 10 years, YouVersion, Life Church, shout out. All right, um, we are going to be in Acts chapter 16. And uh, this is honestly, guys, this is my favorite part of church. Um, a few years back, I did an intro for a guy that was speaking. He was the uh, chaplain of Hendrick Motorsports. And I did this huge, like, let's get on our feet and let's get excited and the word is coming and let's get alive. And people were standing and clapping and man, we was crazy. And then he comes out and he's like, oh my gosh, I feel like Bon Jovi out here. And that has stayed with me over the years because, well, like, shouldn't it? Shouldn't we be that hype? Shouldn't we be that extra? Shouldn't it feel like a Bon Jovi concert? I got to imagine when I get to heaven, it's probably going to be a little closer to a Bon Jovi concert than what it is right now. So we're going to dive into Acts. And I want to give you some context before we read this together, okay? We're going to be talking about these two individuals, Paul and Silas. Paul is a man whose life was transformed by Jesus. Crooked dude, all right, killed Christians, not a good way to get on God's good side, all right? And then he changed his ways, decided to devote his life to spreading the gospel. And Paul and Silas were doing their thing. They're preaching. They're speaking the gospel to others. And they come in contact with this woman. And this woman is a fortune teller. The Bible says that she is demon-possessed, and she's been working for this man, her boss, and making money for him by telling people their future. So basically, you got this woman who says, uh, hey, come here, and I'll tell you your future. And then you pay her boss and her boss makes money and she gets a cut, right? That's kind of how that works. So the Bible says that while Paul begins to talk, the woman begins to shout over him. So Paul gets tired of this woman shouting over him and just says, you know what, I'm gonna cast out this demon. Boom, demon, be gone and cast out the demon. Wouldn't that be incredible if you could like just have that anointing and just do that at your workplace? Like you're in the middle of a point and somebody interrupts you and you're just like, demon, roll out. Like, you know what I'm saying? That'd be incredible. I probably shouldn't have said work. I work here. Sorry, staff. They're going to be mad at me. Anyway, he casts this demon out, and she's immediately thankful. Oh, but her boss, he's not happy because now he ain't getting paid, right? He's not getting paid. He's not making any money. So he goes and tells all these people, tells the government, like, you need to do something. You need to deal with Paul and Silas. Basically, this is what it would be like if this morning when you rolled into Starbucks, if you looked at everybody in line and said, hey, guys, hey. I got everybody's Starbucks on me. Roll up the tab. I got you. And then everybody's response was like, who do you think you are paying for our Starbucks? Man, what's with him? Why is he buying our Starbucks, man? You know what we need to do? Somebody needs to like round up the government, call the cops or something. And then the cops show up and you're in trouble because you just bought everybody Starbucks. That's what it'd be like. So Acts 16, you're going to see it. Verse 22. Here we go, 22 through 26. It'll be up on the side screens. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them to be stripped and beaten with wooden rods, all because you bought somebody Starbucks. 
They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Are you serious? Are you serious? They just did a good thing, and now they're beaten and in prison. And I want you to know that all of us will experience what Paul and Silas experienced at some point in our life. All of us will have a season where you're doing everything good and everything right. And something's going to happen that makes you feel attacked, beat down, like something just isn't right. Life isn't fair, right? Here's where it gets good, though. Back to the scripture. At around midnight, everybody say midnight. midnight. Let's try that again. Everybody say midnight. Yeah, let's stop right there. Midnight. Okay, these dudes just got beat up all day. And I know I'm probably talking to a timeout crowd, but has anybody ever had a good butt whooping? Okay, like I grew up getting some butt whoopings, and I'll tell you how that went. That hurt. I'm tired. That's how that went down. Naps after butt whoopings were the best naps ever, okay? So it's midnight. You've been beaten all day. You're in jail. We expect nothing of you, Paul and Silas. Nothing. I get it. Go to bed. Deal with it tomorrow. But the scripture says at around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing songs to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, everybody say suddenly, there was a massive earthquake and all the doors flew open and every chain was released. I don't want you to miss when the breakthrough happened. Notice the breakthrough happened after their obedience. Peace comes after obedience. It's been modeled throughout the Bible, throughout Jesus' life. Go back to when Jesus got baptized, okay? Jesus gets baptized, not because he was a sinful man. He was a sinless man. Well, Jesus, why are you getting baptized? Because I'm obedient. I'm being obedient. I'm showing that I worship him. I'm showing who my father is, so Jesus, being obedient, gets baptized, and when he comes up, the heavens open, and the spirit, like a dove, hmm, dove, peace, like a dove, ascends on him, and God says, this is my son who I am well pleased. Peace comes after obedience. And this is why worship, worship is not conditional, but it is critical. It's not conditional, but it is critical. It's easy to worship God when you get a raise. It's easy to worship God when your kids are doing good things. It's easy to worship God when you finally got a boo, but what happens when the wheels come off? What happens when you're trying to honor God and your spouse leaves anyway? What happens when you're trying to honor God and you lose your job? What happens when you're doing everything right, but that person still, still dies? What, what happens when you're doing everything that you can possibly do and cancer still comes? Worship cannot be conditional, but it is critical. Because worship becomes a problem to your problem. If you don't begin to worship, there's no earthquake. There's no chains being released. There's no doors flying open, but when you begin to worship, you take that worship posture, that's when breakthrough happens. And I love that it says midnight because midnight symbolizes a new day, a new beginning. And when you take a worship posture, it starts to do something new inside of you. And I don't know when your midnight's coming. It might be 10 years from now. It might be 10 minutes from now. But I promise you, the doors will open. The chains will fall off. You will be released if you just allow yourself to get some worship. It's an extravagant, expressive response to what God has done for you. And I'll tell you, people are gonna question it. People are gonna wanna know, well, if you have a God, why are you in jail? Well, well, if you, well, if you have a God, then why'd you lose your job? Well, if you have a God, then why did that have to happen? Well, if you have a God, then why did that person die? Then why did that happen across the world? Why did this happen? Why did you have to go through what you went through? See, worship says yes to God, when all hell is breaking loose. So my posture, my answer 
will be yes, God, when everything is going well. And man, when things are going bad and the wind is against me and I'm getting beat down by this world, my answer will still emphatically be yes. Let's lighten it. When West Virginia scores a touchdown, I'm elated. I'm pumped. I'm excited. I'm going crazy in my living room. You can ask my wife. You probably don't want to be around me. I'm crazy when it comes to that. And when they lose, which is often, it's still a great day to be a West Virginia fan. When your kid hits a home run, man, you're proud. When they strike out, you're still proud. Because your worship isn't reserved based on circumstance. And that's why worship is so powerful. And you really got to understand this principle because we get it twisted so many times. So many times we think, if God moves, then I'll move. But that's not how it works. It's you must move, then God moves. You must move, then God moves. Worship is a stance. You'll want to write that down. Worship is a stance, not a song, but a stance. It's I'm trusting you. I'm not moving my position. The wind is up against me. All hell is breaking loose, and I'm choosing to stand. I'm not going to change my response based on circumstance. Devil, you didn't give me this joy. You're not going to be able to take it from me. I'm standing with Jesus. And yes, I feel sad. Okay, yes, my body is in pain. Yes, I'm I'm worried about the future, but God is in control. And even though all I see is this chapter, God sees the entire book. And so if I can just get his perspective, he can open up some things in my life that I never thought would be possible. Worship is a stance. I'm glad y'all are clapping because I got more for you. If you go to Psalm 34, verse 9, it says, Worship God if you want the best. Worship opens doors to all his goodness. Everything that God has for you is hinged on your yes. And I know during worship, sometimes we just don't want to, and sometimes we think we're going to look foolish, and you know, I don't want to raise my hands, and I don't want to sing, and I don't really want to say yes, I don't even like this song really, because it's out of our comfort zone, but I'm here to tell you that all of God's goodness is on the other end of your yes. See, when you're at the grocery store, and the person in front of you forgot their wallet, or maybe they simply don't have enough money, and they start just putting stuff back, and God nudges you, hey, pay, pay for that, man. Even if it's $2.50, you just opened up a door to all of God's goodness. And in your mind, you're going to question it, and you're going to be thinking, well, I mean, why do I have to pay for them? Like, I brought enough money for me. Why don't they bring enough money for them? But you don't know it. When you say yes, you open up a door that you didn't even know was there. And when God asks you to call a person and apologize, maybe even for something they don't even know that you said, it's a yes, man. And it's going to cause a weird conversation. It might be a little tense, but God's in it. It's extra. It's worship. It's extreme love, and it opens doors that you didn't even know were there. When you obey God by not going somewhere with your friends, young people, when you obey God by not going somewhere with your friends, because you know it's going to put you in a bad situation, that's a yes. That's worship. Every time you honor God with your resources, you open up a door to all of his goodness. And this is what is so amazing because so many people their entire life stand on the outside of the door and they want everything that's on the other side of the door, but they won't risk anything to step through. But you unlock the door. You open the door. You step through the door with your worship. Worship isn't just a stance. Worship is a sound. Worship isn't silent. Worship is expressive. Worship is extreme. That's why when you go to a concert, you see people that don't even care. They got their hands up, their phone up. They're like, Taylor Swift, baby, I don't even know this song, but I'm going to sing it, girl. Right? What's amazing, though, is that sometimes church, which should have the most reason to worship, and the most reason to shout, and the most reason to express themselves, well, we're, we feel like it's a place we should be quiet. 
And maybe that's because of your church background. Maybe you were like me and you grew up in a church that taught you to be quiet and respectful, dress in your Sunday best, come in. It's almost kind of like a library, just be respectful. But can we just take a look and see what the Bible says? Can we just go to the word and see scripture? Psalm 81 says, sing for joy to God our strength. Shout quietly. Nope. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music. Strike the timbrel. Play the melodious harp and lyre. Basically saying, get the music going. Get the haze up in the room. Turn the bass up and let's all shout with a voice of triumph because we are victorious. And I know the world thinks it looks crazy, but it is. It's extra. It's extreme love and honor and submission to a God who changed everything about me. There is nothing that shouldn't be passionate about our response to God. And you're probably thinking, man, that pastor yells a lot. Yes, I do. (laughs) But if you knew what God pulled me out of, if you knew what God pulled me through, you would shout and scream on my behalf. Some of you have reason to shout. Dare I say all of you have reason to scream, have reason to lift your hands because God has done so much for you. Shout aloud. Why do people stand up and clap? Because they're worshipers. Why do people pull for their team? It's extra, I know. But understand that I'm captivated And devoted by this God that's changed every single thing about me. It goes on to say in Psalm 98, shout your praises to God, everybody. Everybody. You know what everybody means? That means young people. That means older people. That means white people. That means black people. That means Latino people. That means rich people. That means poor people. That means middle class people. Everybody. Well, you know, like, I get it, Pastor Drew, but I'm just not an expressive person, okay? Like, my family, we're a little more reserved. Not anymore. You don't have to be. One of the most introverted people I know, my wife. She led worship this morning. See, our worship is not, it's not a personality. It's not a nationality. You are a Christian. You are a follower of Christ. Your blood has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. So now is not the time to represent who you used to be. Now is the time to represent who you are now. We sing unto God. We shout unto God. And I know some of you in here are not believers yet. That's okay. We're going to get you there. We're just glad you're here. I hope this message just encourages you to get more involved. But man, we're going to get you there. I got to give y'all more verses because you're, you're not going to um, believe me. And worship team, I'm kind of wrapping up. Y'all can go ahead and head up here. Here we go. More verses. Let loose and sing. What do you think? T-Pain came up with that? Let loose. Let loose and sing, strike up the band, round up an orchestra and play for God, add on a hundred voice choir, feature trumpets and big trombones, fill the air with praises to King God. Some of y'all just need to let loose. You know what your father wants to see? Your father wants to see you just let loose and get a little weird and get a little crazy. Let something come out of your mouth. I know it's not gonna sound good to us, but you're not doing this for us. You're not raising your hands for us. We worship King God. That's why we turn the volume up to drown y'all out. (laughs) Declare with your mouth, let loose. Add a hundred voice choir. This looks like a couple hundred voices. I know it's weird, but guys, worship looks weird to people who don't worship. Not worshiping looks weird to people who do. When you see fans going crazy, if you're not a fan of that team, you don't get it. It looks crazy. It looks weird. When, when you see a parent going nuts for their kid just because, I don't know, like they rode a bike down the street. If you don't have kids, you don't get it. It's extra. When God has your worship, 
I, I know you wouldn't do this anywhere else unless you're really extra. Maybe you do it at a restaurant or something. I don't know, but we do it because God has done something in and through us. Worship isn't just a sound. Worship is a stance. And I know we're going a little long this morning, but that's okay. That's on me. That's planning. Songs went a little long, but you stay with me. Okay, stay with me because I got a word for you. Worship is surrender. It's where we give up. It's where we say, God, I don't understand, but I'm gonna surrender to your ways. And that's why we lift our hands and surrender. That's why kids, they'll walk up to their parents and do this. I can't walk anymore. I can't do this anymore. Just pick me up. God, I can't control my circumstances, but I surrender to you. This is what Paul and Silas are doing in the jail. God, I, don't, I got beat up. I don't know how I'm gonna get out of here. I don't know why this even happened. But I surrender my plans, my dreams, my hopes, my future, my resources, my finances, my life to you. Worship is surrender. And not only is it surrender, but some of you need to start there. Many of you came in here this morning, y'all don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you've got something moving and stirring inside of you right now. You know what you need to do? You need to worship. What am I saying? You need to surrender. You need to say, God, just take my life. That life I keep screwing up and messing up, just take my life. So worship him and accept his invitation. Start a new journey with him. Your midnight can be right now. And some of you have accepted Jesus, but never done a water baptism. And you need to just declare that you belong to God. That's what that statement is. I understand it's extra. On a Sunday morning, you wouldn't hop in a tub in front of a bunch of people. I get it. But it's extra. And you know what happens when you get baptized? You're telling everybody, I'm a worshiper. Worship isn't just a stance. It's not just a sound. It's not just surrender, but worship is a sword. It's a weapon. It's how you fight your battles. And you're either coming out of something, going through something, going into something right now, and I'm telling you, you need to worship. But it's a lot like a sword in that from a distance, it just looks like art. You know, people collect swords, maybe even have a sword over their mantle. From a distance, really cool piece of art. Love what you guys have done with the place. But when you hold that sword in your hand, it becomes a weapon. Worship is a weapon. There's a story in the Bible of King Jehoshaphat. I don't have time to go through all of it, but it's 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and King Joe, we'll call him, has many armies coming against him, basically three. He's got three armies, guys, coming to take his stuff, his land, his people. But what they didn't know is that King Joe, man, he's a worshiper. He leads through prayer. And so before the battle begins, he gets all of his people together and he says, I'm declaring allegiance to God. I'm declaring the power of God. I have confidence that he is going to do what only God can do. And on the day of the battle, you know who King Joe sends out? Man, his best archers. Nope. Nah, man, he, he sends out his, his biggest, baddest dudes. Nope. Nope. He sends out his worship team. He sends out these guys. Now, I don't know about you, but that's probably not my pick right now. I got three armies up against me. You want me to lead with my worship team? You want me to put my singers out front? Think about how bold this is, how confident this is. Newsflash church, this is what you're called to be. This is what you're called to be. Bold, confident. I know it looks weird. I know it doesn't make sense to you, but it's all good because we got God on our side. So we're going to put our singers out front. We're going to put our worship team out front. And the worshipers start singing, give thanks to the Lord. His faithfulness endures forever. His faithful love endures forever. When we worship, earthquakes begin. See, it says at that very moment, at that very moment they were singing, the Lord calls the three armies to start fighting each other. And every single person in every army was wiped out. 
Worship is a sword because when we worship, earthquakes begin, chains are released, enemies fall, peace is brought to us. And I'm telling you, some of us in here this morning need to show God our stance and our surrender. We need to show the devil that those obstacles in front of us are nothing because, man, I got a sword and I got God on my side. And we need to bring a sound out in us that brings breakthrough because worship is a stance. Worship is a sound. Worship is surrender. Worship is a sword. Worship is yes. You got to say yes this morning. You got to say yes with your life. Everything God has for you is on the other end of your worship. So strike up the band. Get the haze going in the room. Let's play guitars. Let's turn the bass up. Let's turn the volume up. Go ahead and hit them drums. Let's get our singers out front because we are going to battle. Let's shout aloud for King God.